Hi, good morning and welcome everybody to the Brooker Surface Finish Optimization for Advanced Manufacturing uh, by Optical Profiler. Uh, my name is Robert uh, Sid and I'm with Brooker and I'm responsible for the Optical Profilometry product line. And today we have um, three uh, experts in the area of optical metrology with regards to um, you know, advanced manufacturing and uh, surface metrology and topography measurements as well. Uh, and today we have Don Cohen from Michigan Metrology uh, located here in the United States. We have Raphael de Tom in France of Morphomeca. Uh, we have Samuel Lesko, who's our advanced development uh, engineer uh, located in France as well. He manages a team that uses the optical profilometer in a variety of applications and myself. So part of Brooker is we have a, a very large portfolio of, of optical metrology products, but today specifically we're talking about 3D optical um, profilometry. And wild light interferometry um, is a unique technology in that um, you know fundamentally it, it re re requires the scanning of the optical path difference between a reference signal and the um, signal path. And what happens is you get an interference pattern that's recorded on a sensor array, or in this case, a camera. And the different positions are integrated together in order to render a 3D image of very high uh, resolution. Uh, to provide a little bit more detail, um, here we see a, a schematic drawing of an objective. And what happens is the objective will be scanned in the vertical direction to the surface. And as it scans, what's happening is as the interference pattern starts to form on top of the surface, on top of the surface, we'll get a variety of fringe uh, imprints. And then those fringe imprints are recorded and then processed through a computer to render a three-dimensional image. And here you can see the image as a sort of false color um, a topography. Uh, that we see uh, in the slide there on below. But again, the interference patterns provide extremely high resolution and gives us a really repeatable and high uh, quality of data um, that's useful in quantifying a surface. And where does uh, white light interferometry kind of span in the landscape of metrology in general? Well, uh, here's a um, uh, kind of a, a, a gamut or a map that on the x-axis we have lateral resolution going from 0.1 nanometers out to you know a very large object in, in terms of meters but then also vertical resolution going from something like 0.01 nanometers all the way up to about 10 millimeters and here you can see a variety of technologies AFM, SEM, um, stylus and white light but white light provides a non-contact uh, method of getting repeatable results off a surface. And oftentimes, some of these surfaces are in the sub-nanometer uh, vertical resolution. And so the applications for this is anything that has a surface, um, pretty much uh, optical profilometry uh, could be used in order to characterize what that surface is. And so applications in precision machining and additive manufacturing um, plating coding, we'll touch about on those subjects today, but then more other uh, aspects of you know looking for defects on optical surfaces, um, characterizing components for advanced packaging semiconductor, and even to a degree being able to measure polymer film thicknesses as well. Um, so what I'll do is I'll hand this over to uh, excuse me Samuel Lesko uh, to uh, continue the discussion on some of the details related to optical profilometry. Yeah, thanks uh, uh, for this uh, nice uh, uh, introductions. So let me uh, show me uh, in person. So I'm uh, in uh, application lab uh, in France, nearby uh, Paris, and you see on the back uh, the, for instance, the tribal lab made for uh, tribology uh, testing. Uh, but today uh, we will uh, talk uh, about uh, really optical profiling and about finishing uh, steps. So let me. Uh, share uh, my screen and and get uh, the the right uh, info on that. So let me go for um, 
presentations and then make sure that here we are so we have now the the pointer so the topic um, of um, oops the topic of uh, today is really studying the uh, f surface finishing uh, through uh, let's say optical profilers an example and case I will present is about the 3d printed uh, polymers um, as we know, 3D printed polymer is part of this uh, new trend of additive uh, manufacturing where you build up an object uh, step by step, layer by layers, which allows you a huge flexibility. However, um, what's happening is there are a lot of costs linked to the printing itself as much as with the post-processing. So 30% of the cost uh, are coming from this post-processing step, which is really critical because uh, simply what may happen is everything is linked to, to roughness. So for instance, um, the aesthetic of printed part, whenever you apply painting or try to print with the color polymers, will definitely depend on the surface roughness to make it uh, very uh, shiny or on contrary very matte which doesn't look appealing anymore. The same happen in terms of roughness for the soft and cold touch so whenever you want to feel the object in your hands you expect a certain uh, behavior and sliding which is fully controlled by roughness. And whenever uh, you start to protect uh, this uh, additive manufacture part from dust, uh, scratches or UVs or from um, chemical attack, then you need to bring to them coating which again will only apply an encoder surface if you have the right uh, roughness. The other point is some of the parts uh, are being used in uh, uh, to conduct uh, electricities or contrary to have some insulative uh, behavior uh, which is uh, made by applying a primer and coating over this uh, manufacturer surface which again links back to certain roughness uh, for uh, anchorage of that uh, primer. And also sometimes you may want the surface to uh, be uh, have this capability uh, to be uh, hydrophilic or hydrophobic uh, be compatible with glue whenever you start to assemble multiple um, part uh, together which come back again to roughness uh, as a main core um, part so as you understood as, uh, as roughness is key and uh, the 3D printing uh, polymer parts uh, usually uh, uh, get very rough at the uh, beginning simply by the principle of uh, getting layer by layer or centering some particles together you obtain an inherently rough surface like, like here and the raw part looks uh, usually very made uh, sometimes you even see the, the lines of uh, the building uh, process so in, in that manner, you need somehow to smooth out the surface through a multiple post-processing uh, step and you obtain usually a nice and polished part like this after a numerous uh, processes and it can be as simple as uh, air blasting just to remove non-anchor particles or uh, tiny particles from polymers that are not very uh, adherent it can be a blasting of water or some beads as much as using as well a bit of chemistry with supercritical um, carbon uh, dioxide or for relatively stiff polymer parts uh, which could be uh, like PET uh, ones you can use a regular tumbling uh, mechanical uh, finishings with uh, abrasive cones and uh, having the right time will help to smooth out all the, the angle so white tumbling is really for the outer surface uh, blasting for instance help to go to some of the uh, specific locations 
However, both of them are really limited whenever the parts become complex. So in that case, we will use some chemical polishing to go through or even manual polishing, such as we can apply uh, some dye to the part and you see how well and dark it looks now through the dyeing. And then finally, you can put the painting parts, which goes to create nice uh, looking uh, uh, surface. But all that, as you can see, you have uh, multiple choices as well, multiple uh, steps possible. So the key question is how do we select the proper post-processing um, mean and how do we optimize uh, each of those mean? And this is all about this uh, talk I'd like to develop today uh, based on this 3D printed polymer part. So thanks to the Hoffmann Group from uh, Munich in Germany, um, we have built uh, together a 3D printed part by stereolithography, which is really standard square. And uh, once it is built, uh, so we have number one and number two being the raw build, then all the rest of the square you see in the pictures were made with multiple kind of uh, post-processing step and we'll be able to study and measure the roughness through uh, optical profilers. In terms of data processing and just to assess um, the metrology part, I uh, linked to the ISO uh, 4287 uh, using uh, the regular Gaussian ice pass filter uh, to measure the roughness part. And I'm using the ISO 2578 uh, by the uh, uh, logging the aerial roughness uh, parameters. So as you can see, the sample um, has been made with different processes steps. So the raw sample, which is glossy looking, number two, uh, is a raw one. And then you have like several steps. So a step of abrasive close, a second one, a third one. So we'll measure the abrasive close one uh, after three step. Then you have the diamond polishing block, which are uh, different. And again, we will measure that particle sample. Then the sample further go to diamond polishing pads and we'll measure uh, the uh, after three step of this polishing pad. And finally, we go through uh, a diamond polishing. So as you can see, we're going to very EV grade to very low smooth grade uh, in term of finishing uh, processes and see how each of the steps impact the, the roughness and whether uh, there is uh, an efficient, uh, it is an efficient step or, or not. In terms of finishing as well, we will look for blasting, and blasting will consist of one single shot with ceramic, silicon, and aluminum bead to see um, how it impacts this polymer surface to create, let's say, and develop higher surfaces to uh, anchor for glue or painting, for instance. So all the surfaces will be uh, measured with white line inflammatory uh, profilers. Um, usually in terms of application is this technique uh, is found by our user to be extremely flexible and universal. So you, you can measure very uh, steady rough slope such as uh, a scalpel uh, edge. Uh, all the way to super flat uh, surfaces with uh, let's say sub nanometer. Um, vertical resolutions uh, you can see there or getting all type of different reflectivity uh, or of surfaces so you can have very shiny ape cup ball here or you can have a silver line which is very highly reflective versus uh, the pattern silicone for this photovoltaic uh, panel uh, as much as working with like white-ish, semi-transparent or translucent uh, surfaces. So all that can nicely match together with high lateral resolutions uh, up to uh, hundreds of nanometers laterally. Here, as you can see, line space by 200 nanometers. So this means this technique actually has all the key attributes uh, uh, in order to measure uh, surface texture as well as roughness. So you, it's a combination of 
enough uh, sub let's say nanometer vertical resolutions and enough lateral resolutions such as we can apply uh, the roughness norms so let's start with uh, uh, the blasting study so blasting consists of projecting beads uh, with a certain flow rate and certain speed for a certain time over a surface in order to create uh, some topography um, here is a summary of uh, the initial surface where we nicely see all the printing line uh, and sometimes some disruptions. And then you see the resulting surfaces display with the same X, Y, and Z scales. So you have the same color code and same color um, um, scale for uh, the vertical range. So red means high point, uh, Blue means uh, deep points, uh, depression, for instance. And what we see is basically uh, all the ceramic blasting, silicone or aluminum blasting really disturb the surface very much and create a lot of uh, roughness uh, over there, which is then understandable whenever you want to move from a very smooth surface like the printing one where you nicely see all the the polymer being very smooth in between the uh, interdigit um, but in, in the meantime when we go to aluminum blasting for instance you can see that we have texture of the surface with hills and valleys which is exactly uh, the main point for blasting to create actually a, a a rougher uh, surface to ensure better anchorage and it's not a surprise that all the surface get the made appearance because of this roughness so what you can see already visually is the blasting effect um, uh, brings made appearance but now what we want is to gauge efficiency and to put a quantification behind it so from the initial data sets what we apply is a special uh, filtering with Gaussian filter and a bandpass of 0.8 to 0.08 millimeter to measure uh, some kind of waviness and the as I pass a Gaussian filter below 80 microns such as we have the proper microstructures and basically here what we select is and we measure some error uh, roughness parameters uh, such as we define the blasting process effect as well as the micro texture so what you see here is interesting because in the one single measurement this uh, one anthropometry technique uh, allows actually to capture both of the roughness big uh, let's say big waviness created by the blasting as much as the micro textures of uh, representing the impact interaction of the bead with uh, the polymers and here as you see we will be interested to um, some kind of uh, uh, mean uh, roughness essay why uh, over there will be more interested to uh, develop errors and uh, uh, density of peaks so if we look to the overall um, uh, roughness of the blasted surface we if we look to the initial glossy surface we we have very sub microns uh, roughness which is very low why whenever we do blasting we see a dramatic increase uh, almost a one order magnitude increase of the mean roughness and this help uh, of course uh, to uh, create a necessary cavity for the system to anchor such as primer as well as uh, making the appearance very mate because here we are referring to the micro roughness so the macro textures which will diffuse the light and make sure that you don't have um, any more transparent um, or transparency uh, uh, effect and as we can see is now between ceramic silicon and aluminium we have indeed uh, very much uh, difference uh, in term of mean roughness why we could expect that for this very hard materials versus a soft polymer surface 
that won't be uh, an issue. Uh, but actually, aluminium, which is the softest one, seems to create a higher level of roughness. So in that way, uh, we can elect aluminium beads being uh, the best enhancer for the micro uh, textures. So if we move now to uh, different um, waviness level. So we are on a waviness level where we want to create uh, craters on the surface and quantify those craters. What I've used here is to plot two main aerial parameters. The one is the developed interfacial ratios, which is very low and close to zero for very smooth surface. So why it's pretty uh, high whenever it's more wavy because whenever we uh, stress these lines into a flat one, you see that you have way longer uh, line. So when you see a 0.5 level, this means you have 50% increase of the developed errors uh, uh, over there. So that's uh, be very helpful to really quantify the impact and how efficient the plasting is. In other way, what I have uh, plot is the numbers of peak per um, square millimeters. Uh, this parameter is called SDS. So whenever you have a very low numbers of peak versus very high for the same length, uh, this is where we are going to very low numbers uh, of peaks per square millimeters all the way to very high. And what you see is on the blue, uh, the developed areas clearly increases for ceramic and silicone, but it's far higher whenever we go with aluminum blasting again. And in the meantime, while the ceramic and silicone create a lot of peaks, uh, we have slightly lower amount of peak for aluminum. So basically aluminum has a more efficient way to create, uh, let's say, uh, a higher developed areas, which will be beneficial for anchorage of paint, for instance, or glue, while minimizing the numbers of peak, which could be counterproductive if, if the part uh, needs to, uh, to be smooth afterward, and that could create with the number of peaks some kind of sense of filling whenever we are touching the part, which will not be uh, the one that we, we want. So in that uh, respect, uh, we have really monitor, quantify, and also emphasize the efficiency of different blasting uh, conditions and have electric aluminum bead as being the best choice for that type of polymer printed surface. So now let's go for the different polishing uh, uh, and getting uh, from high or let's say certain smooth surface to uh, some kind of uh, tail or a package uh, surface. So the main idea here is we want to get rid of the regular uh, printed pattern and we want the surface to be, let's say, homogeneous uh, and have an, a very low uh, roughness. So in that respect, when we go to initial glossy surface again, where we nicely see the printing part, uh, if we move to the same image, XYZ scale speaking, after the 3D, let's three step of grinding, um, you really see that we, let's say, get rid of this regular uh, patterns and you see all the scratches left by, by grinding indeed. If we start to do some uh, diamond polishing block, uh, we start to create a bit of, of waviness and start to remove the scratches, but not that much. So for that, we need to really go to the polishing part where we start and see uh, that we're getting rid of, uh, let's say, the small scratches, the big scratches still remains. And finally, uh, with the polishing clauses, we, we are getting uh, almost uh, uh, there and get a smoother surface that looks at least here visually uh, homogeneous. So from there, again, we will use uh, the processing uh, of data sets to filter out and select the right components. And in that case, we'll start with some subsampling uh, to make and avoid, uh, let's say, uh, details. We are not interested here. And finally, we'll go for a high pass Gaussian filtering to uh, have the remaining roughness part of the surface. In that case, we will use 
S parameters height, hybrid and special from 25 and 78 norms in a way that we can get uh, different parameters such as we can really characterize the impact and the influence of different uh, finishing uh, step. And for each one, you see that we will uh, mainly look for the, the mean roughness. We will look about the autocorrelation length and uh, about uh, the average um, slope uh, uh, roughness over there. So first of all, as we say, the whole principle of a finishing process is to try and reduce the mean roughness. So what you see here clearly, if we start to the initial glossy surface, we reach 1.2 microns uh, roughness due to the fact that they, we still see printing uh, lines. If we start with grinding, um, you see a dramatic drop and as we further progress we have a nice exponential decay of uh, the roughness, meaning that if we go and polish further down and using multiple, uh, let's say, technique from polishing block, pad and clauses, we aim to very low um, roughness. So we could say, yeah, job, job done. Um, however, if you start and see on the low roughness now, if we do a bit of better representations with shading, you start and see that again we have the same line as we had before and that's the main uh, concern. However, as it is illustrated here, the SA only codes the amplitudes of uh, that uh, roughness. So we, we have no indication about the spatial uh, variation, so about the frequency, do we have a very low fluctuation or on contrary very um, uh, a sudden topographic change. If the amplitude is the same we will get the same SA. So SA as a mean um, average roughness is not enough to qualify the process and this is what we want to see with adding the length that time with autocorrelation lengths and the autocorrelation lengths helps to understand, let's say, the space between uh, the periodicity of the topography. So if we have, like, in that case, you see the different lines, we have a large uh, spacing, so the uh, autocorrelation length will be very high. In terms of grinding, on contrary, we have destroyed this organization and put a lot of fine details which allows us to get a very high um, special frequencies, so a very short uh, autocorrelation length here. And as you can see, very interestingly, is once we reach the grinding and start to do further polishing, what we get is indeed some kind of increase of the uh, autocorrelation length, which means that uh, at some point, we can just elect a certain optimum saying, hey, we want and don't go further because here in the next step, we are actually decreasing again this autocorrelation length. So we are certainly creating sm uh, sm small scratches or revealing some finer details, which makes this step of polishing clothes unnecessary. The other point is now about understanding texture. So again, uh, whenever we speak about post-processing, what we want is some kind of homogeneous surface. Homogeneous means we want a surface without clear directions. And actually, if we look to the surfaces on the left or this one on the right, you can clearly establish that you have some specific um, alignments uh, which correspond to how the grinding process was made. So certainly the paths were made horizontally and vertically. And if you look to a polar um, graph, you clearly see an extension of the roughness power on the horizontal way and almost at 90 degrees. Um, on contrary, after polishing, what we obtain is some kind of revealing again the former structures of printing 
So the polishing actually uh, act differently between uh, the very dense or low density uh, materials in between uh, the lines and revealing again the structures and you can clearly see one main direction being horizontal. And what the texture aspect ratio STR does is just quantify this. So zero means definitively uh, you have one single uh, directions. If it's uh, close to one, you will have absolutely heterogeneous, let's say homogeneous surface without any uh, texture. So in that case, uh, what we can see is the two step of polishing pads actually are making the surface more oriented to one side. So it's either due to the printing uh, principle, either due to the fact that the polishing occur in one so, um, one way back and forth. So that's something that needs to be improved regarding the second and third polishing step. Uh, why, as we see, the polishing block does very well in terms of getting the surface more homogeneous. And to finish with, we have the uh, to track the smoothness because this is what we want in the, in term of finishing step, and we want, for instance, to distinguish mate and clear appearance. And in that case, the average slope SDQ parameters directly codes the uh, f slope fluctuation from the surface, so combining amplitude and periodicity. And again, what we see is Greening creates a lot of roughness, making the surface fully made, so you have a higher um, uh, degrees here, or slope around 9 degree, Why the polishing step successfully clears that down below 1 degree slope, so very smooth. So you directly get a smoothness of topography being uh, measured here. So optimum again seems to be uh, the second step of polishing pad. And now as a summary, if we can start and plot the processes on how much autocoloration length they get versus the, the mean roughness, you can see that we have an initial glossy surface and the blasting just definitively increase the roughness and simply uh, shorten the correlation length. Why, if we start to do pre-finishing, we see that definitively we inc we shorten the co autocorrelation length, getting the surface, let's say, higher special frequencies, uh, but having a, a mean roughness which is lower, so decreasing the roughness, before moving toward the finishing, where we uh, actually uh, leverage out the fluctuation, getting longer, uh, autocorrelation lengths, which is the natural process. In the meantime, we can plot the texture aspect ratio where we want it to be like homogeneous as a surface and get the mean roughness. And in that case, if we think about having transparent and very shiny surfaces, this will be that space. So definitely what has been done does not go to the right uh, direction and failed. And the same point is, whenever we go for primer and painting, what we want is a certain roughness, but a, a being homogeneous, otherwise we'll tend to create a structure, and this is what uh, Don Cohen uh, will speak about on, on this um, next uh, slide. So what you can see, it's very easy to go out to that space and define and quantify this uh, processes. And as uh, Lord Kelvin will say, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And the whole purpose of that uh, talk was to show to you a case study where a 3D polymer printed part was fully assessed with an optical profilers um, through the different uh, uh, finishing processes. And we were able to quantify, to rank them, to elect some optimum in that ways and definitively quantifications will allow you to further optimize uh, this uh, process in order to shorten the step, but also to understand how each uh, process step impacts your surface, such as later on you can better control 
uh, the production and use the optical providers as the final control for the uh, product uh, and a finishing uh, step. So thanks for your um, attentions and if you like to get more uh, insight or questions later on feel free to contact me through uh, uh, email. So I'd like to uh, now uh, uh, ask whether there, there are questions um, Robert or whether we move to the next uh, presentation. Uh, the floor noise on the measurements we were making is around a nanometer level. So this is the, the let's say the, the by principle of that technique, uh, the floor noise you obtain. So what you get is uh, really a f refinements uh, at a nanometer level. And when I speak about floor noise about nanometers, this means uh, you can really differentiate uh, roughness from, let's say, uh, having 5 nanometer roughness compared to uh, 10. So this is at, le at that level. So when, whenever you see a, a difference of mean roughness being uh, 0.1 or 0.15, that evenly significant. Um, and also that's the reason why I was able to measure the macro uh, texturing on the blasting for instance uh, even using uh, low magnification objectives li like 5x objectives uh, that was used for that study uh, we will have uh, nanometer or even sub nanometer vertical resolution in in uh, some of the cases of uh, smooth surfaces So the, the size we're um, absolutely uh, the the same. Uh, we are in in a range of tens of of microns. So the overall size distributions uh, was almost uh, equivalent. So only the um, let's say the the hardness of uh, the beat was uh, different. The rest, uh, the conditions like the, the flow rate uh, and the time uh, spent under the blasting was e exactly um, the same. Okay, well, thanks for allowing me to give this presentation. Uh, basically, I'm Don Cohen. I have a company, Michigan Metrology, here in Michigan, where I've been using the Bruker NP Flex for a number of years for measuring surface texture. I primarily work in the automotive industry and in the medical industry and some other material science related industries. This presentation came from a fairly large project that was done here in the Detroit area over the last 12 years, uh, basically trying to understand the connection between the substrate used to make cars, like car doors and car trunks and hoods and things like that, and how that affects the final paint appearance. So it was a big project that was funded by a consortium called US Car, which was basically the big three, the big three automotive makers in the US. And it was spearheaded by a number of people, as you can see in this um, title here. And the, um, uh, I wanna make mention of a few people here. Alexander Pete is one of the key guys that led all this work and then other people as well as from all the different industries here uh, that supported the research. So the research was done for about 10, 12 years. We basically accumulated sta you know, panels and all kinds of data from the industry, which led to this report. This project was reported out at a conference in 2015, so nothing in this is confidential. Um, and then I should say for those in the, uh, that were, you know, Ford, GM, Chrysler, they can get to all the data uh, through the US car uh, consortium. So anyway, I'm going to go through just what we learned. It was uh, an interesting little problem because what was going on was this is, again, back many years ago, is that people were painting cars at the same time, you know, they would paint a car, all the panels at once, front door and rear door. And then the front door and rear door wouldn't look the same at the end of the day. The, the paint finish would be different. 
even though they were painted with the exactly the same paint process, I mean, literally at the exact same time. So there had to be something else going on. And what was going on is over the years, you know, we've been changing materials a lot, uh, using aluminum, using steel, using uh, uh, carbon fiber, things of that nature. Uh, but also the paint systems have been changing. They've been getting thinner, frankly. And for environmental reasons, different solvents are being used. So as a result, all these kinds of things came together and it started affecting the actual appearance of the paint. And one of the issues was whether that difference in appearance was related to the substrate, the actual underlying, in this case, steel. Uh, after a lot of work, they were able to isolate one particular problem where truly the front door and the rear door painted differently. Both steels were meeting all the specs they had in the industry. So the steel mills weren't like missing spec. They were all meeting spec. But yet they were painting differently. And it turned out the substrates were the... Uh, one of the key factors in affecting that paint appearance. Uh, so this was kind of an interesting find. Uh, again, imagine what was going on here. You know, you're making, you know, just millions of tons of steel being manufactured for the front door, for the rear door from two different suppliers. They're all meeting the current industry standards, but yet when they painted the surfaces, they were notably different by eye. Uh, so this is what kind of started the project, and then the project kept growing from there. The, um, the, the, what I want to kind of, um, let me just turn the laser pointer, it's kind of just review it, and Samuel did a really good job of it, and I'll just review it real quickly, is this notion of when you measure surface roughness, really the first question we should ask isn't like, how rough is a surface? We should be asking, what spatial wavelengths of the surface should we measure? And then we can determine how rough, meaning how what's the amplitude of those spatial wavelengths. Uh, unfortunately, for many years, people have just, you know, gotten some type of gauge. It's set to some bandwidth of spatial wavelengths. They measure a surface and get a number, and that's it. That's RA. But as we've learned over the years, and as has been discussed previously, we have to be concerned about what the spatial wavelengths are. So I like to think in terms of hiking a mountain. If you try to hike this mountain, the first question you'd ask is, you know, can I do it in a day or do I have to stay overnight? So the question would be is, how far am I going to have to hike from one end to the other? And so I look at the real long spatial wavelengths, wavelengths that may be measured in the sense of miles long. And so these yellow lines might represent miles or quarter miles. And I would look at this and say, ah, this is what I call the form of the hike. And the form looks like it's going to be three, four miles long. I can easily walk that in a day if it was flat. Given that it's a mountain, okay, it's going to be a challenge, but I should be able to get it done. Once I'm on one particular slope, I kind of remove that slope from it and look at still longer spatial wavelengths in the sense that I'm looking at wavelengths that are maybe measured on the order of hundreds of yards or something. And I look at kind of what the terrain might look like for each hour of my trip, and I plan accordingly. Am I going to have to cross little rivers or climb small hills? And then I might be concerned about what's going on underneath my feet. So I might be concerned about what kind of shoes I should measure, should be wearing. So I look at spatial wavelengths that are basically one foot or shorter, and that I might call the roughness. And that might affect basically the type of shoe I would use and whether I'm going to have to worry about slipping on the mountain or whether the mountain's going to have really deep, you know, rough mountain rocks that are going to cut through my shoes. So as a hiker, I look at at least three different spatial wavelengths. The form, the waviness and roughness, we tend to call it, to get a sense of what the trek is going to be that I'm going to have to challenge. And this is true in any surface challenge, any surface application. The first question should be, what spatial wavelengths do I need to measure based on the application? And then once I decided what spatial wavelengths I need to measure, what's the amplitude, the slope, all the different parameters we can discuss. When it comes to looking at the way light interacts with a surface, and a real simple case of understanding it, it's a, more complicated than this, but this gets the idea across, is you can think of it as that the spatial wavelengths kind of relate to the way the light scatters, meaning the angle the light scatters and reflects off the surface. So long spatial wavelengths will sort of reflect the light over a smaller angle than really short spatial wavelengths, which will tend to scatter the light over larger angles. Um, also, again, this is very simplistic, the larger the amplitude, the peak to valley height of the surface, the more light will get scattered. So a long wavelength will tend to scatter the light closer to the incoming beam, 
a short wavelength surface texture might scatter it wide. So to your eye, this might look kind of like an orange peel sort of look, a more of a distorted image, and this might look like haziness to you because the light will get scattered in all kinds of directions. And the magnitude of that orange peel or haziness will depend upon the amplitude. This is a very good, real simplified way, but yet you can see how surface texture wavelengths first have to be asked when you're concerned about saying one surface doesn't look the same as another. The question is, why does it not look the same? Is it waviness, meaning is it uh, orange peel, longer wave kind of distortion problem, or is it more of a short wave hazy thing? That's what you have to be, to be concerned about. One of the instruments that are used in the industry, the automotive industry, to measure the final quality of the painted surface, so this is the final painted surface, is something called a big wave scan. It's a real nice device. You kind of roll it along the surface, and it basically picks up the light as it scatters off of the surface and partitions it into a series of bandwidths, just like we're talking related to these spatial bandwidths, WA, WB, and so forth through WE. And these roughly correspond to spatial wavelengths on the surface. For example, WA is 0.1 millimeters to 0.3 millimeters, WB 0.3 to 1, all the way out to WE, which are very long wavelengths, 10 millimeters to 30 millimeters. And again, these four or five different bands are what we perceive when we look at a car sur a surface finish as to being a good paint job or a bad paint job. Or what you'll find is a lot of the different manufacturers have their idea of what a good painted car looks like, and they're different, as we might know. And, uh, and how they differentiate it is these different strengths, if you will, of the measurements in WA through WE. If one were to take a series of samples, and this is an example, some real data that was collected through this whole study, um, we, just to illustrate the project, what we did here is we took some um, samples we call Bob, best of the best surfaces, meaning the ones that painted best, and then wow, worst of the worst surfaces, surfaces that painted the worst, and then some in between, as well as a standard surface called an ACT CRS standard, which is a very smooth surface. And we took the actual substrates and then had them painted all at the same time. You always want to paint things at the same time so you eliminate any variability between the paint process. And you can see for this series of steel panels, these were steel panels, we got a big range of what we call a WB result. So this is the spectrum of W values, WA, WB, WC, and so forth. And uh, you can see for most of the other bands, the samples are pretty close. But in this WB band, this is where the problem was. There was something going on in a bandwidth of roughly 0.3 to 1 millimeters of spatial wavelengths. And these units on the left are just called BIC units. It's kind of a proprietary unit that the BIC company standardized for. So what was happening, again, in the industry was the front door and the rear door were looking different, and they were, they were definitely showing a difference in this WB band. But once again, the steel suppliers were like, look, we're meeting print, so we've, it's not our problem. We met the incoming print. And this is a lesson to us all on surface metrology or engineering in general. Just because parts meet print doesn't mean they don't have problems. Meeting print doesn't mean you don't have problems. It just means you met, met the print. And you might not have the exact thing on the drawing that you need in order to differentiate good and bad parts. If you were to measure a substrate with a standard stylus device, just like one of these deck tacks, and looked at all the spatial wavelengths, we'd get a full spectrum of different spatial wavelengths that make up some general steel surface. This is a trace of about 15 millimeters, and you can see it has an amplitude of about plus or minus four micrometers, and there's all kinds of different spatial wavelengths. We've got real long wavelengths and very, very short wavelengths and all in between. We can look at that in a, in a way using, a, if you will, a spectrum analyzer approach. Uh, different companies have software for this one I use is digital metrology, which gives you an actual spectrum of that uh, basic waveform or basically surface texture. And what's being plotted here is the amplitude versus the wavelength that comprises this surface and you get a spectrum. Just like if you're looking at the spectroscopy in a chemistry experiment, you're looking at the spectroscopy of the surface texture. So we can begin to think of a surface texture as just being composed of different spatial wavelengths, just like you might think of light being composed of different wavelengths from red to blue we can talk about spatial wavelengths making up surface texture the same way, and we can begin to look at the spectrum of that, and then begin to see in the spectrum what might be going on to differentiate one sample 
from another. What's done in all the different instruments, uh, whether you know it or not, is there's some kind of filtering going on, meaning you measure as many spatial wavelengths as you can. We're usually limited by the scan length, how big the image is, and, and the lateral resolution of the instrument, be it a, an optical instrument, might be limited by diffraction. The atomic force microscopes can be uh, very, very short spatial wavelengths and confocal different spatial wavelengths. So your instrument measures all the different spatial wavelengths, but your instrument also applies filters to it. Uh, it now, hopefully, in your software, you can see very clearly what the filters are. But one typical filter an instrument is usually you know, shipped with is a 0.8 millimeter filter. This was the kind of standard filter used in the machine industry for many years. If you bought just a real off-the-shelf, low-cost stylus, it was pretty much set to a 0.8 millimeter cutoff, which meant that wavelengths greater than 0.8 millimeters, again, spatial wavelengths greater than 0.8 millimeters, would be attenuated by 50% before they'd actually be analyzed or measured. So if I had a spatial wavelength, which was 0.8 millimeters, and the peak-to-valley height is 1 micron, after it was filtered, it would be a half a micron, and that's what I'd actually measure. So I could really have a surface with a 1 micron peak-to-valley 0.8 millimeter wavelength on it, but if I use this kind of standard 0.8 millimeter cutoff, I'm going to measure it as a half a millimeter peak development, even though it's physically 0.8 millimeters. So this has been an issue because, again, you know, in the old, old days, all the instruments tended to default to a 0.8 millimeter. And even some of the earlier, earlier standards said 0.8 millimeters was like kind of a standard or default cutoff, but there's nothing magical about this 0.8 millimeter cutoff. And again, if you learn anything from this webinar, learn to ask the question first, what spatial wavelengths should I be measuring? Set your filters to those, and then go ahead and look at the different roughness parameters. This, in turn, was what turned out to be the problem with the paint finish. Once you've determined the bandwidth you're going to measure, now we look at the parameters. The, the one we've already talked about, SA, three-dimensional average roughness, or RA, two-dimensional average roughness. Just a simple absolute value. Measurement of the profile height, you take the absolute value of the profile heights and average them over the length basically taking the area bounded by the profile and the mean line and just adding it up and dividing by the length. And that area doesn't care whether it's positive or negative. And so that's what RA is. And then the other parameters of interest in the paint industry are related to spacing or spatial information. So one of those uh, that's getting some popularity is called RSM, the mean profile spacing. So when you look across the surface, you look at where the profile crosses the mean line and you kind of add up those lengths and divide by the average number of cutoffs, or average number of sample lengths here. So there's SM1, SM2, add up those lengths, and then just divide, in this case, by four. Another parameter that's used for measuring spatial characteristics is something called P-count. But in this case, you have to actually specify a P-count level. So this is yet another specification that has to go in the drawing. And you set this level, which is really an envelope, and the profile has to go above that envelope and below that envelope before it's counted as a peak. And then we count the number of peaks per unit length. So these are some of the parameters that are used in the automotive industry today for assessing the spatial nature of that surface texture. At the time this work was done, again, it's about 10, 12 years ago, the standard that was out that drove the manufacturers of the steel was SAEJ 911, which clearly specified a 0.8 millimeter cutoff and a peak count level of 1.25 microns. So this is all in the standard. If you were going to make steel to sell the auto industry, you would use this standard. You'd measure the RA with a 0.8 millimeter cutoff. You'd measure the peak count with a 1.25 micron uh, th threshold. And if, as long as you met the drawing spec, you know, your tons of steel were considered good. But remember, here's the problem we had. After we painted steel that all met the print, we would still see a pretty big difference, particularly in the painted surfaces in this bandwidth WB, you know, 0.3 to 1 millimeters. And now just think about that. So in the bandwidth we're measuring the painted surface, the actual bandwidth right in the center of it is pretty much a 0.8 millimeter wavelength, which we already attenuate by a half before we even measure the steel, let alone greater than 0.8 millimeters. So right where the paint was giving us some trouble, was exactly at the bandwidths that the steel was being measured as considered good or bad. And uh, so no one was wrong here. The steel did meet the print. The trouble was the way the paint behaved, it was very sensitive to spatial wavelengths in this band of 0.3 to 1 millimeter. So again, this is what we're after. We'd like to measure with this uh, optical profile the surface texture. 
and then compare that, and that's with the substrate, the actual raw substrate, and then compare that to the final painted surface. So remember, there's a lot of steps between you know the steel coming out of a steel mill and it ultimately being painted. So there's a lot of things that go on chemistry there. Um, and the question is, is there actually a correlation? We know it affects it, but is it one-to-one, -one, um, that type of thing. So again, this is the way the BIC machine works. We just look at the different bandwidths. With the optical profiler, we can nicely measure now some very large areas with really high resolution. I might say when this work was done, we didn't have this capability. Again, this goes back now 10, 12 years, and we were limited to very little strips of data, like 10 millimeters by one millimeter was about it. Uh, but with the newer machines, we can do hundreds of images all stitched together like shown here. And we could do a 16 millimeter by 16 millimeter image uh, of, you know, this would happen to be of a, of a steel panel. And then we can look at all the different bandwidths. So what we decided to do was, okay, we know there's something going on in the visual final painted sample in this bandwidth of like 0.3 to 1 millimeters. Let's start to look at spatial wavelengths that are in a broader band. 0.15 to 2 millimeters. That's what we really want to see. And we can begin to like look at all the spatial wavelengths we see here, but then just remove all the shorter wavelengths less than 0.15 millimeters, remove all the wavelengths greater than 2 millimeters, and it's this texture that we'd be interested in to see if that correlates to what we actually see on the final painted surfaces. And indeed we found it. We found a really good correlation again with steel surfaces uh, and this represents a lot of data points, a lot of different steel suppliers. It wasn't just one supplier. Um, and you can see the range of incoming average roughness values from 5 microns down to 35. Um, and that was as measured, again, in that 0.15 to 2 millimeter bandwidth. Okay, And we could see a really nice correlation. Remember, this is the average roughness of the substrate, the steel, versus the final painted after all the processes of paint as measured by the BIC machine. So we saw a really good degree of correlation there uh, to kind of do it. So here qualitatively shows you what was going on. Uh, it's really a striking example of just how critical it is that you first ask the question, what spatial wavelength should I measure? As opposed to just measuring something for roughness, period. Which, which means nothing unless you tell me what the spatial wavelengths are. So this was the actual a sample of what we would call sort of the good surface, the Bob surface. And this was sort of a wild surface, not the very, very best, not the very, very worst, just some typical ones. But if you had the opportunity 12 years ago to see this big image, you'd see they were different. That, you know, seriously, by your eye, you could see them just qualitatively in light with the light microscope, there were differences. But the steel suppliers said, hey, we meet print. That's not our problem. And they were right. They did meet print. When they measure these surfaces with a 0.8 millimeter cutoff, they all met print. But you can see this surface has a lower roughness, meaning that the reds aren't as red and the blues aren't as blue as many of them. And it's also a very short spacing. These are what we call tighter texture. And this worst, worst of the worst tend to have a more coarser texture and a lot more rougher amplitude. Nonetheless, the SA here is about 1.3. The SA here is about 1.6. Spacing here is about 0.3. Spacing here is about 0.5. So you could see something going on here. But here's what was actually being measured for all those years. Because when a supplier would measure that surface with a 0.8 millimeter cutoff, again, this is the real surface. This is what they thought they were, you know, painting, basically. So this is after you apply a 0.8 millimeter bandwidth. So wavelengths greater than 0.8 millimeter are removed. Wavelengths less than 8 microns, turns out, are removed. They start to look very similar, their surface textures. The average roughness SA is 1.2 on the if you will, Bob, and it says A is 1.2 on the wild. So, I mean, just the average roughness values are actually happen to work out the same if you average down a little bit. And the spacings are a little different, but not grossly different. And so steel manufacturer of the wow, steel manufacturer of the Bob, measuring with a 0.8 millimeter cutoff, they both meet print. Uh, one of my colleagues in the industry likes to do this, and I'm going to do it, is he says, this is the real surfaces, but these are the surfaces you think you were painting. So you were thinking you were painting this, but this is what you really were painting. And that's, again, because of these spatial wavelengths not being clearly defined. What we went ahead and did is said, all right, well, let's look now at the spatial wavelengths that are 0.15 to 2 millimeters. So really centered around that WB band. And sure enough, you can see some pretty significant differences in the substrates. This is just the substrates again. And, and SA now is like 0.8 versus SA of 1.2. Spacing's not all that different, 0.6 to 0.7.
And uh, again, using this bandwidth, we were able to relate what we were measuring on the final painted surfaces quite nicely. Even more exciting, if you look at yet another bandwidth, let's look at the 3 to 10 millimeter bandwidth. So go even longer wavelengths, and you can really see the wow had this problem, right? The, the longer wavelengths were kind of dominating in the wow sample. It was sort of leaking into the WB. Uh, and uh, SA here is like 0.3. SA here is about 0.1. Now, the point, though, is, is that even though the substrate here had obviously higher amplitude, longer wavelength structures than these, this didn't affect the appearance all that much because the paint could kind of compensate for this. The trouble was the paint had trouble compensating for that. And so now this gets us into the issue that you have to not only look at the substrate, but the interaction of the substrate with the whole process. That's a big key thing. So as you begin to do your correlation analysis, the parameters you put in that model not only have to be surface texture, but in the case of paint, it might have things related to the paint viscosity, for example, and things like that, that may be able to show maybe an, a degree of interaction between surface texture and, say, paint viscosity, or insensitivity to paint viscosity. Those are the kinds of things uh, we can do. As a result of all this work, a few years ago, uh, we worked together with the SAE uh, organization and, and basically updated the standard. So a big thing that came out of that U.S. car project was a more modern, I'll call it, SAE J911. It was published in 2017, where we now bring forward this idea of spatial wavelengths. Uh, there's nothing magical about a 0.8 millimeter cutoff. Uh, the, 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 the supplier customer relationship has to specify, again, in the actual document, what spatial wavelength should be measured and what average roughness or peak count or RSM they desire. So this is starting to work its way uh, through the industry. So the future of all this work continues. Uh, what's happened now is the U.S. car group has been disbanded. The project was completed a few years ago. And uh, so all the, the different people have moved on, and, and they're using the data. It's become a bit more proprietary, as you'd expect. Uh, basically, this whole idea of looking at different spatial bandwidths now gives you yet more clues as to how to control the outcome of something, such as paint appearance, by optimizing the different spatial wavelength characteristics of your substrate. And it can relate to other things besides just the paint appearance in the WB band, you know, shorter wavelengths, as I mentioned, may relate to haze, uh, the peel look, wet, dry look. There's all kinds of different looks people call out uh, on a paint finish, um, as well as issues related to adhesion and whatever. Uh, it just gives us now that next level of understanding of first start with what are the spatial wavelengths I need to measure, then go on and consider what are the basic uh, parameters I should measure in those bandwidths. And the last point is just, again, that you, you, you tend to fall into this trap because this works so well. We began to look at other projects, trying to solve every problem by looking at spatial wavelengths on the surface texture, which it didn't always work out. It wasn't just the substrate surface roughness in a particular spatial bandwidth that could cause a problem in final paint appearance. So paint is a very complicated process, and so you do need to consider other chemistries and other things that go on together with the surface texture. Uh, the idea, of course, is that you want to make the process as robust as possible to surface texture or variation as well as others. So with that, any questions at this point? And I can move on. Thank you. Hi, Don. There's, there's one question that came up with regards to um, the band here. Uh, it's 0.3 to 1 millimeter then why would the user use a bandwidth range of 0.15 to 2 millimeters? Yeah, good question. Yeah, the reason we chose that was, if you think about it, it the BIC machine kind of is, you know, it's sort of a general number of like 0.3 to 1 millimeters. And again, the, the filtering, the way you set up a filter, like a Gaussian filter, whatever wavelength you cut off, that cuts off 50% of the amplitude before you actually analyze it. So if I was trying to measure a one millimeter wavelength structure, I would actually want to have a wider bandwidth than one millimeters, like two millimeters, to be sure I capture the one millimeter. So that's why we chose a wider band. We also did it empirically. In other words, I changed bandwidths in order to get the most contrast on the really bad samples we had. So that's how we kind of came up with that. But, but the idea is to be really careful that the, the cutoff wavelength you choose, like if you use a point, eight millimeter 
cutoff wavelength, we call it, then you're not going to be able to measure accurately wavelengths that are 0.8 millimeters wide. You're going to be cutting all those in half, their amplitude. So you might want to double that. If you're trying to measure something that's 0.8, you know, use a 2.5 millimeter uh, wide bandwidth in order to do that. Okay, thank you. And for the audience, um, I know there are several questions out there as well. And there is a Q&A session towards the end of the uh, presentations here. And so we'll have uh, Don, Raphael, and Samuel um, address some of those at that time. Th thank you so much, Don. Thank you. Uh, and then next, I'd like to bring uh, Raphael. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. It depends on where you are. So I'm pleased to be invited here by Brooker. So I must thank, first of all, all the Brooker staff and especially uh, Samuel. So I'm going to show you um, a presentation on rudeness and specifically what texture for what functionality and how to characterize it. So. I'm going to present me. I am uh, Dr. Uh, Raphael uh, Deltombe. I have a PhD in mechanical science. For the moment, I have a position at the LAMI, which is a CNRS uh, laboratory, and I work as a research engineer. So I am a part of mechanical morphomica uh, team, led by Professor Maxence Bijarel. So our research are centered on the texture analysis and the physical functionalities. So, but my specific activity are on exploration and analysis of microscopic texture applied to industrial manufacturing pieces or in order to identify specific roughness signature as a function of environmental uh, parameter like process parameter, lifetime, for example. So now we need where we can where we, we can meet us or find us. So we are located in the north of France, near Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, Luxembourg or England. We are located in the Polytechnic University of Eau de France, UPHF. We are a part of the LAMI, which is a CNRS laboratory and the Carnot Institute. But what is Morphomeca? Morphomeca is, um, is a both research and a te technical platform, which has been inaugurated in 2017. So the main objective of this this um, platform is to explore and analyze and analyze uh, surfaces from decimetric to nanos nanometric scale. So this uh, platform has been financed by European Fund. So I have to thank you if you are from Europe uh, for the taxes you gave to us. So the objective of Morphomeca platform is to build new tools for the morphological exploration of surface on scale where physical, chemical, or biological phenomena appears. For example, there is for biology, the cell size, for uh, manufacturing abrasive particles, for wear, etc. So what texture for what functionality and how we characterize it. It's the main question we can ask. But under that, there are more questions because there are many different questions, texture. So here, there is an example of different texture with different parameters. That's why there is class A and class B. This is a sample of our numerical databases. These databases, we can meet bearing, blasting, brushing, uh, the wear of a knee prosthesis, cold rolling, hot rolling, cold rolling, shot blasting, machining, polishing. There, is, there are many, many kinds of, of, 
of uh, of texture. So we have we can ask more questions that what is the process to get it to get this, that function? What texture for which functionality and which topographic feature? So parameter for which functionality? So we have many many different kind of uh, func of texture. So when we want to, to find the relationship between surface texture and functionality, you are going to make something very intuitive. So first, we start to explore them very quickly, as, as quickly as possible, and calculate parameters using different kind of standards. So this standard use different filters, and uh, they are not uh, very. Um, we can not move them. So after uh, we can try to link the physical functionality with these different parameter. For for example, we can have parameter that reveal uh, that reveal themselves to be different but there are no, uh, nothing to do with the functionality. So it could be an error, it could be a, um, a roughness, a form that uh, is uh, just uh, um, dependent of, of the machining, for example. So in most cases, we, we fail. So why we fail? By doing that very intuitive uh, methodology. So we fail by because when we measure um, the surfaces, what you are searching is very partial. So the real surface contains all the information, but when we explore it, it will be truncated. It's due to the microscope ability by digitalize or thresholding and it's the ability for the device to, to measure it. So we need some help. So like this quote of uh, Dalbom, we can't do we can't do much carpentry with your bare hand and you can't do much thinking with your bare brain. So we have to find a tool to solve to solve smartly this kind of challenge. We are trying, I'm going to present you, to find a generic tool, easy to use, making steps in order to drive your thinking process applied to functionality and texture relationships. So I call this this um, this tool a smart surface explorer the smart surface explorer make it possible to set a specific point to ensure good exploration analysis this methodology smart is well known for writing goal and objective like doran said so it's for manager so i use the same idea by using each letter of the smart word for the, each step in the thinking process to explore surfaces. So there is for the first letter, the scale. What is the scale of the physical phenomenon? The second way, the second step is the measurability. What is the most suitable exploration tool? Second, third step, accessibility. Can we explore the surface safely? Reliability, which filter and morphological parameter are most representative of my functionality? And the last one, but not the least important, is the time and how long will my exploration and analysis take? So let's explore using a different uh, example 
uh, these, this kind of process and this kind of thinking process. So the first step is the scale. So the scale is the, of a phenom phenomenon is what we are trying to characterize. This idea, the first step, this idea is very, very important because it's the scale of the phenomenon we want to characterize. For example, take a simple example. For current loss in high voltage cable, it's the corona effect. We can see a picture of the corona effect. It's, uh, you know, the humming noise you can hear when you go under a high voltage cable. This phenomenon generates an electrical loss of 10%. So this um, phenomenon is follow a simple law. Um, it's the peaks law. So although it's empirical, it's this law shows the dependency of the loss uh, of uh, corona by corona effect by uh, the curvature of the peak on the cable. So this, this signify that the geometry of the electrode plays a decisive role in the breakdown voltage. So this means that in surface exploration, we need to be sufficiently um, precise to define the peak of the phenomenon and also the curvature. So with this idea, there is a large number of physical laws, sometimes empirical, that characterize the dependency at the surface. So take in mind, take it in mind that you can uh, go in different uh, uh, in encyclopedia or like Wikipedia to find law or maybe in the academic literature, you can find law that can guide you into the good scale and what you are going to, to characterize. So we need before starting to know what we want to measure and at what scale. The second scale is the measurability. The measurability is the ability to measure surface by means of topographic device. So what is the best device to explore to for my surface? So we can visit our lab. So can I use interferometer? Can I use focus variation? Maybe a tactile one? or for, for the best of us, the AFM, or maybe another, another, another one, interferometer. So what is the best uh, device to, uh, to, uh, to measure our, uh, our um, phenomenon? So we must ask a question, what is the smallest scale? If we, uh, we talk about interferometry, the optical resolution, the, the, the lowest, the smallest um, resolution is given by the Sparrow criteria. So we can see here that as we increase the magnification, the lateral resolution is going to decrease. So some improvement could be done on contour jetty with the VXI uh, mode. So we have to choose which lateral scale is the best suitable. I just talk only on about the lateral scale because the 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 z z scale is is always the best so 
we need to choose which one we can we can uh, we can uh, use so for our example on corona effect with the loss of energy by uh, on high voltage cable uh, we use the the maximum of magnification it's the this one so we think at this moment of the process thinking that this objective will give us the best uh, resolution to define the curvature and the peaks we can't do better so now we have the smallest scale but we have also to have the 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 larger scale because we can't only use a smaller scale with the, the smallest image so we have to be statistically representative of the physical phenomenon we have to take at least it's a empirical law at least five res representative patterns so in our case it's the biggest uh, peak we can have in one picture so how can we do this so we can do this by uh, using stitching a stitching is a way to to make a panoramic view of of the data so it takes a different picture with an overlapping and you can stitch all together so we take an example this is um, something i have measured uh, it's a circuit breaker element and we need to measure the planet plenity of the of the three things we can see here so uh, when you need to uh, to to stitch this kind of of thing you can't just measure this and after move there you have to be a continuity of measurement so for this example i use a specially de design um, piece using 3d printing this makes a continuity in acquisition of images of data all along the, um, the the measurement so this is what we have if we use full scale but if you reduce the time of measurement you can this uh, this kind of of process so for our example of the beginning with the corona effect uh, we take one square millimeter for the larger scale this describe at least the statistical of the physical uh, physical phenomena so we take one one square millimeter so we can find the curvature of a wire so after we think we have uh, succeed in measuring it i can ask if i can access to the surface so most of the surface are not flat so sometime it's important to uh, take care, take care that the the objective don't hit the surface so if we Go, we uh, we have a look on the working distance of different objective we can see that the more the magnific the magnificent is the more the working distance is small so that could be a trouble you can have trouble if there is a, a very uh, round shape or in this way or in this way so for 
example, if we can't uh, go on the surface, if the shape is too large, for example, rolling mill, and it's not possible to bring them to the, into the laboratory, we can use uh, replication. So replication is a way, a smart way, to uh, obtain uh, roughness of different kind of um, different kind of texture of replication. So we work on this kind of uh, of uh, replication using different uh, polymer, but we have to take really care how the the every environmental condition are for the dust, temperature, humidity, and vibration that are not or may be favorable for the polymerization. So we work on, the, on a different way on our uh, team, on different way to obtain a uh, different uh, way to, to uh, replicate surfaces. So, in our case, we cannot access directly to the cable. So we need to uh, to to fix it, to uh, to clamp it uh, before. So we extract each wire, we and cut them into small parts, and we can put all of them under. Uh, the, the objective. So it's going to be very easy to measure it because the focal plan is uh, for all the different wires at the same uh, focal plan. And this enables us to be uh, automa automatized. So the next step, and maybe uh, there is a lot of literature uh, about this, but it comes after we are sure that the data are really good. So the question is, is my data a representative of the physical phenomenon or the functionality I'm going to looking for? So before making an analysis, I have to to clean up the surface. So remove artifact, fill and measure point, remove the, the global shape. So now we can uh, find the good parameter and the good scape uh, by launching an analysis of variance uh, at all the scales, at all the scales using high pass and bypass bound pass and low pass. So this has been developed by a specific uh, tool uh, to find the best relevant functional parameter. Because we have to find for each scale the best parameter and which one is the best for, for us. So I take an example for the reliability. It's an example of the roll wear. So this is a texture of an hot roll, which had been replicated using the rec replication method I have presented before. So the texture of the hot roll, you have stripes here. So first of all, we can make an analysis to find what is the, the, the process parameter which um, wear the, the most. So using the analysis, we can find what stat statistically what is the most influencing uh, parameter. So we can see that that the millage that will create the more uh, worn of the roll. So after, here, it's the best parameter we can use to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to modelize our process and the 
the, the connection between the worn and roughness parameter. Here, it's an example for a new uh, role at different scale. That's the work, the way the, the, the tool MESRIG is, is working. So you have a multi-scale decomposition of all uh, the parameters. So now we can just have a look on the SA parameter, which is a very um, very good parameter and was uh, well uh, classified with our methodology. So we can we can see that there is for each scale, each wavelength of the filter, we can see there is a good correlation. After that, there is no more correlation. This is due to um, a noise. Uh, uh, a noise for the measurement. So we don't use um, the, the scale smaller than 17 micron. So if we mix all the different pillage, we can see that this is the new one and after the one one with def different kilometers. So we can see there is two curve and there is an inflection here for each one, except for the new one. So we can notice that there is a different phenomena and different wear phenomena. So if we have a look on the on the, on the surfaces, because we don't have to lose that these parameters are made with these uh, surfaces, we have to have a look and to, we can distinguish the two different, uh, the two different uh, uh, wear phenomena like abrasion, adhesion and abrasion. So we can distinguish this, this two. So for zero, it's only abrasion because it's machining. And for the other one, we can have different Different, different, different process of wear. So we can come back on our example of the corona effect. So as we said um, at first, we need to characterize we very well the peak and the um, and the curvature. So we can link the density the peak density with the loss measure on the on the cable so we can notice there is a relationship be, between spd and loss that's very interesting so we can have a look on the surfaces because we don't have to lose the, 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 the meaning of the SPD and the real surfaces. So the, the SPD give us for the cable zero, it's a blue one, a very, a lot of peak and very big one. So you have big, big peak, but no, not a lot. And for the cable five, which is the gray one, we have a lot of peak, but everywhere. So this uh, this kind of process, um, the process of sandblasting, give an homogeneous surface compared to that, and this induce induce a big loss of energy. So there is the homogeneity, but um, we only use the, the, the peak density and not uh, the curvature. 
but we can measure the curvature using motif, so uh, motif uh, methodology. So we need to have the good scale in order to have enough significant peak. So the smaller scale and the, the, the larger scale. So in our case, um, the micro roughness, it's not that plays a predominant role, but it's the, the quantity of peaks that, that make uh, the corona effect. So we need to capture the mass to have a statistical representativeness. So that's why the, 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 the step before reali reliability in the smart methodology is very uh, important. So, for example, to, to go through this remark, we can test different objectives with different zoom. And we can see that as we go higher and higher, the, the resolution is better. So we can think that the, the, the best is that. So another point is um, that each objective gives a different uh, response. So if we want to compare different, uh, different, uh, different surfaces, we have to use the same objective to have the same resolution and also the same treatment like filter and must be identical to compare with the other surfaces. Neither you can't compare because it's not, um, it's not good. So the last one and not the least, uh, and the least, it's the time. The time is an important element in topographic analysis. It's the measurement time we have the measurement time is something we have to take into account. So um, when I take the same picture that than uh, the before, we can see when we use a low magnification, I take 20 seconds. But if I use the highest magnification, it takes more than one hour. So when I talk about um, the mass of peak, I, for example, with a magnification of five, I can measure for the same time more than 1,000 area. But if I use the highest resolution, I can measure only five in the same time. So we have to, to have a good balance between the, the mass of uh, data and the re representativeness of the data. So statistically, we have more information here than here because we explore more surfaces. But here, we have more resolution, we are more precise, so the peaks are more defined, but maybe the parameters are more steady. So all the elements that we described uh, before must be uh, time modulated. So we have to, uh, to take care of, uh, of that. So not only for the measurement, but we have to take into account that the analysis time is also important because analysis time could also uh, take a lot of time if you use different kinds of filter, uh, robust filter, or maybe filling of non-measure point, etc. So this, uh, this, this time is very, sometimes very long. So so we have to, to always balance with the time, with the, the time of the, the cost of a study is the time. So to, to sum up the, the methodology, um, 
we have developed a smart surface in order to uh, smart surface explorer with different type in order to 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 be good when we want to link uh, measurement robustness with functionality and these different steps are very very uh, important so you can follow uh, these steps and you can you can uh, you can succeed but as said mike tyson when he was asked about a fight with Holyfield and about the fear of the, of the fight. So he said that everyone has a plan until he gets punched into the mouth. So don't forget that maybe a, a plan could work, but sometimes it could fail. So thank you for listening to this uh, presentation so you can contact us using mail or you can follow our work using uh, google scholar and i put a link so we can work collaborate and learn together so thank you for your attention thank you very much uh, rafael uh, indeed uh, very passionate uh, stuff and uh, I'd like to uh, really uh, thank you very much to remind us that uh, Corona is indeed a, a physical mean and, and nothing to do with, with the virus uh, initially. So thanks a lot for, for that. Thank you. Um, also, as a, let's say, a higher level summary, um, against uh, about the symposium, as you have understood, is all the questions to look to the surface and define let's say the right scale as well as extract the right parameters so i'd like to answer the questions through let's say a practical uh, sessions over the optical profilers you, you see there and one of the question was um, that was asked and uh, that um, you nicely uh, um, let's say uh, pointed out as well rafael was how big we can get so Basically, this is some kind of uh, samples we can we can measure uh, on this uh, small system. Um, we can measure uh, well, on a bigger, large platform samples up to 300 by 300 by 300 millimeter with around 50 kilos or so. So we can place uh, a small car engine on this uh, optical uh, profiters. And uh, what I've, I've placed is uh, uh, samples uh in uh, that system and i will uh, start and and share um so let's see uh, to show my screen and uh, normally uh, now you should see my uh, uh screen uh, over there Do, can you confirm uh, robert and rafa that you see the the screen with the system yes good I perfect so what what I place is I've placed uh, uh, an EDM standard sample. So you have different uh, finishing uh, through uh, electro erosions. And what you see here is the uh, image in focus of that surface. So you, you, you can see that I can move away my, my fringes and you see this nice textures. And this is, by the way, the way you find out the best uh, location to measure and which kind of setup. So I could potentially cover a larger era with, with a 5X objectives. Um, and when you start and see already optically speaking is the detail sounds too small. And it's too small because uh, we are covering a larger field of view, which is around 2.3 by 1.7 millimeter. Uh, but also we have a, a pixel sampling around 3.6 micron so we won't see anything below 10 microns basically this is what it means so you are limiting yourself and visually you you know that it's better to go uh, instead of having uh, this 5x objective is better to go to a 20x but we could say and argue that we could use a zoom lens like a 2x lens and and try to see as well the point is the 5 is objective as a natural resolutions uh, around two microns, as Raphael pointed out. So even so, we have a good pixel of one micron, 
we still don't see any details below five, six microns because of the 5x objective. So here we have a 10x equivalent. But actually, if I switch to 20x and together with a 0.55 uh, zoom lens, I still have almost the same magnifications. However, now what I see is I clearly have the same sampling. But the 20x has a true lateral resolution, which is below 0.9 microns. So I start to see a couple of microns details, which should be perfectly fine. So, and as we were speaking about time, if I take a single uh, measurement like this one, uh, you see that the scan uh, is quite fast, and the, the the display of the result will be quite quite fast. And as you can see here, I can use um, vision map, which which is the 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 mountain um, software integrated with our system, uh, but I've used uh, in term of measurement. Every time I've used the uh, uh, standard vision 64 data set. So so now what we see is we see a nice uh, image, and now I can start and extract. So what what I did is I use a lot of uh, the a special uh, filtering through the Gaussians. And this is what Don uh, did as well to elect uh, different special things. And uh, what I see is the way to fine tune the measurement is indeed to display uh, what is, uh, let's say, high pass, so the, the roughness uh, here on the left, and the waviness on the right side, which is the, the low pass. And uh, here you can determine exactly what's happening changing uh, the the cutoff so here we have a, a range of 600 microns uh, which is pretty low so we can uh, use maybe uh, 250 microns as a, uh, a cutoff and then see how it goes how we split contribution so now you see on the waviness we we really see the uh, long uh, uh, changes, which is maybe due to uh, uh, the, the the process of moving the EDM probe around the surface, or it can be the surface itself, which is not flat. And here we, we are now uh, about the texture left by the EDM with some um, holes of peaks, such as we can now work out informations with the different S parameters. So if I call the I parameters to have the SA, which are around 0.2 microns, that's very quick. Uh, but if I start to use like some kind of hybrid where we're working uh, some information, you see that it took some time and it would take more and more time if you stitch together images in order to get back uh, all this uh, mean slow fluctuations, develop errors, or some kind of peak uh, density or mean radius of, of curvature for those peaks. Um, there was a question regarding what would make sense in terms of parameters uh, regarding ceiling surfaces. And in that case, what we will uh, mobilize is certainly uh, the bearing informations um, so with the Abbott curve because parameters such as the, the SPK uh, will definitely be important speaking out what is the height of the this, this peak in average and facing the surface so this Abbott curve tells how the surface sustain the pressures and how much of the points are in contact so the 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 flatter this bearing curve is, the better in terms of uh, sustaining the pressure across all the surface. The more you have, let's say, an S-shaped curve, the more you will have leakage uh, through the lowest point. So the SVK will be important as much as uh, some information about the volumes of this uh, valleys, which, which is more uh, about um, a1 and A2, uh, or uh, the more you have peaks that will prevent the two surface to effectively seal. So that will be another point uh, uh, over there. 
and uh, you can use some of the uh, former S parameters uh, called functional to get information such uh, like the uh, uh, SV, which is the density of um, volume for the pits per uh, square millimeter or square nanometers, let's say. Um, so this will be something for, for the bearing to, to work out. But now, since we have all that set, we can compare surfaces. So this is the lowest grade of a, uh, EDM, which is really the finest one. If I move now um, toward a different uh, scales and where we will get rougher uh, surfaces uh, obtained, So now let's uh, find a focus. So now you see the 20X does not encompass many of this motif. So it will be better in that case to capture the reality of that surface, to zoom out with, with a 5X uh, and get a larger field of view and get enough of, of this uh, pattern to be described. And in that case, I can start to quickly get it with a, one single measurement uh, obtained the result. And remember that with uh, this technology of white line interferometry, I don't care about the objective I use, the vertical resolution will still be in, in a nanometer range or even lower. But in that, now in that case, you see everything is calculating uh, back and it takes, as you see, a certain numbers of time to, to get out all the information uh, calculated. And now once it's done, we can come back and see uh, what kind of uh, like volume we have. So now you see the SV is much higher because we have a higher roughness, we have higher cavities. So this will be the wrong kind of surface for sinning, for instance, because there will be a, a, a leaking path uh, over there uh, that will make uh, sense. So this is a way you, you can build and make your uh, texture uh, uh, around. So now I'm trying on on the on the line to to get information. So that was a question, and this was a question certainly uh, from from Tony da Silva. That was a question for more um, Rafael about could the ISO uh, 12085 based on the motif profile parameter could help to conduct the the studies. You, you show on uh, hot uh, rolling uh, and uh, on the, on the wire as well for the with the corona effect yes uh, you can hear me yeah so we can use uh, motif uh, analysis in order to uh, just um, isolated different uh, kind of uh, uh, of uh, texture uh, pattern like peaks or different kind of pattern and this is for for the for this uh, for the analysis of the corona we can uh, extract a different motif and measure a curvature for each motif so um, for the parameter uh, like SPD, it's more global. And using motif uh, analysis, uh, it's more local. So you can extract only uh, the, um, the, the peak of interest. So it's, uh, it's, more, uh, it's more interesting. It's not the same way, uh, but it's more, uh, it's more defined. So for example, yeah, like, like, like this, Samuel. So, you, yes, so you, so for each, each, uh, each uh, motif, you can, uh, you can have, uh, for example, curvature, uh, different parameter, the eight and each one, and you can, uh, you can extract a different parameter uh, for that. And this is, uh, uh, parameter which are really 3D. So uh, there is uh, not a lot of parameter 3D, but this kind of analysis is 3D. 
absolutely so here that's for instance i work out the the uh, equivalent diameters ira and height or depth of this of those cavities uh, with the with the motif which is uh, a great insight uh, that's the reason why we have integrated vision map in our um, a set of analysis such as we gain such uh, calculations and there was maybe a question more for Don about uh, the questions uh, regarding uh, on how much uh, stamping process and zinc coating, co uh, coating contribute to the surface roughness. Uh, that, that was interesting to uh, understand and it's clear whenever you start to measure, you will get uh, ability to see some coloration. Uh, with respect to your experience, Don, did, did you figure out any of, of the coloration whenever you, you start to stamp a part or do some uh, metallic uh, coating like zinc coating for let's say, uh, or galvano, uh, galvanic coating, yes. whether the, the roughness was modified? Yeah, yeah, indeed. A lot of that was in that in that big project. Um, so we we yeah we looked at you know not only the what we call the EG steel, but all kinds of different hot dip galvanized steel and uh, different pro different steps along the way, as well as before and after stamping what the surface texture was doing. So all that's a bit proprietary. So the the answer is yes. There's definitely some effect you know all those things can make a big effect and the different uh steels in particular uh like i said the different types of steel this project that i kind of am allowed to report on is sort of older steel it's just basic eg steel but indeed uh there is a lot to be learned by the different types of materials and it will affect the surface roughness which in turn affects the uh, final paint appearance as well. So it's a it's a point taken. If if again if the people listening are with any of the big three, for GM or Chrysler, they can get to that data. That data is at the US Car Foundation. Good. Yeah. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, answer, Don. And there was a question about this uh, smart methodology for for you, Raphael. And it's uh, uh, it's about uh, do we uh, do we have on the smart technology any um, uh, let's say some kind of artificial intelligence about uh, the past experience uh, helping you to uh, quickly converge with with the right uh, special wavelengths, uh, right scale, as well as the right parameters, or is that just based on the non-neuronal approach where you systematically work out all bench of parameters, all bench of scale, uh, before having an automatic selection of the parameters? No, um, we, we don't, don't have, have an automatic, automatic one. one. For, For each study, we have to know what kind of uh, functionality we want to, to see. So that's why the first step of the scale is uh, is uh, interesting. So we are going to adapt uh, how we are going to to look as a function of what uh, we want to look. So we have to adapt that. So for the moment, it's not automatic. No, that it's, it's clear that that's there is no magic. Uh, I would say I think Don, myself, and. And, and, and you, Raphael, can testimony that is all about understanding, first of all, which um, functionality we, we want and correlate roughness. And of course, we, we have to remove any other scales, which uh, are, for instance, the shape and the form. So if you have a, a shape issue, it doesn't matter uh, how much the roughness varies because the shape will be the primary uh, issues. And also, uh, if you have any chemical contaminations, uh, then uh, you can understand why your glue uh, has an issue of uh, sticking two parts together because the surface are contaminated. And again, there's no real um, tractions to measure surfaces. But whenever you have a process in place where you have good clue that roughness could play a role, definitively the, the new 
uh, ARL norm provide foundations uh, for you to measure and even quote and spec on uh, uh, technical drawing some of the parameter we use. And for instance, the optical providers is a quick way of having a non-contact, fast and very precise technique to measure surfaces and extract then uh, valuable information for texture. And as uh, without any any prompt or any uh, synchronization between uh, the speaker, we all um, brought some uh, nice uh, quote from, from famous uh, scientists or, or spot man. And in that case, I like to remember, uh, to, re to remind to everyone this uh, Lord Kelvin saying, uh, you can't control what you can't measure. So make sure to measure uh, your surface texture, you will gain uh, control. So. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all the, the speakers today. Thanks, Don, and thanks, um, uh, Raphael, for the participation. I'd like to thank, thank the audience as well to, to have joined us uh, and stay tuned because you will have uh, uh, the uh, presentation recording uh, being distributed to uh, everyone who participated. And also, if you need uh, access to some of the slides, please uh, make sure to contact us by email uh, and uh, we will uh, make sure we can forward this uh, slide deck uh, to you. So again, thank you. Stay tuned because we will have uh, an, a next coming uh, webinars in uh, July. And uh, I've, if you have any more questions, uh, you have our coordinates and uh, you can drop to us uh, questions. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you, Samuel, so much. Thank you. Thank you, Raphael, Don. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.